Hello and welcome to Bloomberg Quint. What a day or 24 hours in politics it has been in India. In a game of chess that would put grandmasters to shame, the BJP and its leader Prime Minister Narendra Modi have succeeded in capturing Bihar politics. On Thursday, that's yesterday, Bihar Chief Minister Nitish Kumar resigned after his government's alliance partner, the Lalu Prasad-led RJD, refused to address corruption charges. Soon after, the BJP parliamentary party decided to extend support to Kumar's JDU to form government once again. Nitish Kumar is expected to take oath as chief minister again later this evening. The 24-hour drama has put Lalu Yadav out in the cold and given the BJP a giant foot in the door in Bihar politics. Bihar is amongst the few large Indian states in which the BJP has not been able to achieve electoral success and form government. Does this clear the path to Modi domination of India? And what does it mean for the economy, business and of course stock markets? Joining us to discuss that on Indian Open is veteran political journalist and editorial director at the Queen, Sanjay Pugalia and veteran journalist Shankar Iyer. Gentlemen, to both of you, a good morning. Before I get to the economy and stock market impact of this, Sanjay, what do you make of the 24-hour drama and what does this mean? for 2019 and Modi's near domination of India. Uh, totally right, Menka. Uh, what we thought could be a very audacious dream in Mr. Modi's mind appears to be now a real game plan, which is, mark my words, 40% vote share and 400 seats for NDA. So with getting uh, Nitish Kumar in NDA's fold, it looks like a real plan that Mr. Modi wants to break his own record of 2014 and look at 40% vote share and 400 seats in Lok Sabha. Bihar was the biggest hurdle in terms of ideological fight and electoral fight. There was a possibility that Mr. Nitish Kumar was the only person who could challenge him on the morality, ethics, clean image, and could be a cementing force for opposition uh, alliance, exactly like Mahagarbandhan in Bihar, that dream is now totally gone. So Mr. Modi's uh, victory for 2019 appears to be a very strong possibility. Uh, Shankar, the opposition stands further decimated, uh, if that were even possible. Uh, what does this mean for the politics of this country from here on? And more importantly, how it will craft economic policy? Well, we've reached an unipolar status in politics. I think... Uh, the Congress, I have said this earlier, and has some market share and dealerships. It has no product. They tried to cobble up a product uh, in the last elections and made some uh, improvement when they joined with Nitish Kumar and Lalu uh, in 2015. But they have no game plan and they have no program. This is a fight of ideas and the Congress is bereft of ideas. So I think uh, as things stand now, uh, the BJP is in a monopolistic market and uh, it's doing its IPOs. It's, you know, it, it's acquiring market share both organically and inorganically. I mean, it's winning elections in states and it is sort of creating uh, options how well the Nitish Kumar drama has been scripted. I mean, it was written way almost a year back. And the first uh, signs of it was Nitish Kumar supporting the demonetization scheme. Uh, and then they waited it out. Nitish Kumar waited it out to see how BJP did in UP. So the entire Gangetic belt is now with the BJP. And it is so well scripted that the governor happens to be in Patna that Nitish Kumar happens to be in the first row of the presidential oath taking. And exactly there's one giveaway was uh, BJP President Amit Shah walking across to meet Nitish Kumar. And probably that was fine tuning of the arrangements for the events of yesterday. So what this shows is that BJP is on the ball. They are political entrepreneurs, whereas uh, Congress and the other opposition parties are in the brick and mortar business in the age of e-commerce. Well, that's well put. I must say though, the markets main car this morning, while a lot of people would have anticipated will show a gung ho reaction, they are muted. But this is for the long haul, and that's my question to Sanjay. Really, we arguably have two budgets uh, before the next election, Sanjay. 
that uh, those two events notwithstanding, would this give the BJP the wherewithal to go ahead and implement reforms as they deem fit? Because this will be seen as a coalition of parties, if, if I can use that term, which has the clean and clear image. Uh, reform in our book and reform in Mr. Modi's book have different definitions. Anything that can create political controversy and impact the bottom of pyramid voters, Mr. Modi will not still touch it. But to create a perception that he is moving towards some difficult reforms like labor one, uh, there may be some movement. But I do not expect him to go whole hog exactly the way I do not expect him to go whole hog on privatization. Shankar, what would your uh, assessment be of any change whatsoever in the government's economic policy? Because I would agree wholeheartedly with Sanjay, what, what reform means to us is not necessarily what reform means to the Modi government. And honestly, we've seen very little of it. It's been a government that's been fairly centre or left of centre in its approach to the economy in the last several years. So, a uh, quick take on what you think it will mean for economic policy and whether you think that this added strength will change the way Modi government has been crafting policies? I don't think there will be any major change. Mr. Modi's politics is very simply defined. It's about entrepreneurship. So economic policy is simply an instrument to achieve political ends. So I don't see any big bang reforms. He has his own uh, calculus on what needs to be done, when it needs to be done, who will do it and where it needs to be done. Having said that, they have a great opportunity because they will be in power with coalition and on their own in roughly 17 states. So, and most of the reforms that need to be done are in the states. So, if Mr. Modi wants to sort of present himself as the great reformer in the 2019 elections and a person who has delivered transformation in India, then this is his 18 month window. Shankar, the question is, now does he need to have or establish reforms which have a political agenda? Because in his mind, he would think that 2019, as of now, seems to be a given. Why not go down the other route? I don't think that is either the case because, remember, this is like an army moving forward, which is conquer, consolidate and conquer again. So what yesterday's event show is that there is also one more piece called reclaim. So the next governments, they will be focused totally on politics. So the next parties on the target will be AIDMK, BJD and already Mamta is on the target. So their move is to reclaim and conquer and they will proceed on that. I don't think they will move too much to the left or too much to the right uh, because without uh, derailing the economy, they have to achieve this. Remember, uh, they have 31% of votes and they have to move to 40, which means that they can't lose the crucial middle class votes. And that requires the economy to move. Their big challenge really though, and that is a question that he will face in 2019, is where are the jobs? Uh, Shankar, I'm glad you brought that up because that was my next question to Sanjay. Uh, Sanjay, you know, leave aside reforms or privatization or all those fancy things that we've spoken of in the last two decades in India. The critical question here is jobs and as Shankar raised, reform or uh, change at the state level, none of which has been visible in the last three years or has been visible in very, very small measure in the last three years. So. I know that the markets will, to some extent, maybe cheer stability in government. And that's always a good thing in any country, I would imagine, from the point of view of markets. Uh, but is it really going to move the needle when it comes to economic growth? Is it really going to move the needle when it comes to better corporate performance or when it comes to employment or when it comes to, uh, you, know, you know, further boosting rising markets? Any of that will get impacted by the fact that Modi gets stronger. Uh, uh, before I answer that, just one uh, small update. Now, uh, Mr. Nitish Kumar will be taking oath at 10 o'clock, uh, uh, just little uh, uh, around now it is 8.30 or so, 10 o'clock. The time has been advanced because nobody wants to take a chance. 11 o'clock, Tejasvi, Tejasvi Yadav wanted to go and meet the governor. So, governor has now pre pawned this from 5 o'clock to 10 o'clock. That also shows, uh, Shankar was mentioning about how 
well scripted. The whole thing is that they do not want to take any chance, and now they are going for swearing in at uh, 10 o'clock. Coming uh, to uh, your question, uh, look, market. I think there will be lots of action uh, which will support markets, and markets will look good. Real growth. I do not see any possibility of a great significant uh, turnaround. Uh, as far as jobs are concerned, I have been saying this mantra that Mr. Modi or Mr. BJP's politics, the emotional attachment via patriotism, via nationalism, via class war, first demonetization, and now you will see lots of action on Benami property front, on uh, black money front. So the class war between Amir and Gari will be such uh, noisy and powerful uh, narrative that Mr. Modi knows it, that I won't be able to give you jobs, still I will take you. Excellent, sir. It sounds less like a right-wing government and more like a left-wing government in the way you describe it at this point in time, Sanjay. Uh, Shankar, I think, you know, one last question, and I know that this is the question that civil society will be asking, not necessarily markets and business, and that is that uh, should we be at all concerned about the domination of India by any one party, especially a party that does not hesitate in infringing on personal rights in any fashion? Everybody should be concerned about a single party system in a democracy because oligarchy may work in Russia, but you know, oligarchy in politics is a very bad idea. And for the BJP itself, it should want to have a competition because democracy and growth in politics is all about competitive ideas. And we should look at this as a temporary phase, hopefully somebody in the opposition will wake up. Uh, this is too large a democracy to be left to a single party, single ideology system. I think what's critical for the sustenance of democracy and for economic growth is that there must be competitive ideas. Absolutely, gentlemen. We're going to leave it here because we've got a bunch of uh, market reactions to talk about as well. But thank you to both of you this morning for analyzing what the outcome of the last 24 hours in politics will be. And as Sanjay has just updated us, uh, we can expect Nitish Kumar to take oath as Chief Minister at 10 a.m. this morning uh, before the RJD has any chance in being able to meet the governor and stake any kind of claim. Uh, thank you to both Sanjay and uh, you know Shankar. And I believe we have some comments coming in from market participants, Neeraj? Yeah, so we put out a couple of these as well on the site to BloombergQuinn.com. But Sanjay, that director of quantum securities and astute market watcher mentioned earlier that barring the much needed correction that this event may cause, which also seems doubtful, uh, the markets and stock prices are driven more by economic outlook, company earnings, macros and liquidity. None of these are impacted by the event. So he believes that the long term trend will continue. He probably foresaw a correction for, for his reasons, but these are his thoughts. Ajay Srivastava of Dimensions Consulting, of course, went out and said that it is a great positive, obviously, as the last vestige of opposition front is now gone, leading to a clear path on political future and thereby economic agenda. Ajay does believe that there will be some strengthening of the economic agenda. Sale of PSUs is now certain, is what he says. No. Well, that's an odd assumption to make because so far they've had majority in the Lok Sabha and uh, they have still not been able to consider pushing through the sale of PSUs. It's only in the last three months that we've heard them talk about the sale of Air India. Mm. Despite the fact that the Niti Aayog has put out report after report on many of the smaller companies that in yeah. fact can be disinvested. Uh, so I don't think it is this government's policy to sell government companies and I'll tell you why. I remember speaking to one policy wonk very, very close to the government and he said at a time when you know jobs is the question number one, do you really think we might jeopardize the jobs of those employed mm. in the PSU sector, even if we think those PSUs are inefficient and underperforming, by selling them in private hands, because we know the moment they go into private hands, there will be pruning, and we don't want to be held accountable for that job loss yeah. at a time when we are not able to create further jobs. So I don't think a big PSU sale is what will be the outcome of any of this. Yeah, but that's what makes markets, right? People of different beliefs coming in, in the same marketplace sure. and trying to trade. The only thing out here, Minka, my view, is that this was never about what could happen as a result of one state and one leader uh, as chief and architect as he may have been of the opposition ranks coming into their fold. It's more about belief. It's more about grabbing the mindshare and this definitely helps the markets believe that 2019 seems to be a certainty.
All that's right. probably the bigger takeaway from the market's perspective. All right, fair enough. Uh, that's it then from Bloomberg Queen. Thank you very much for watching this morning. Uh, and uh, we'll come back with more as the market session gets underway. Thanks so much for watching.